Um, I'm Jamie Power from One to One Media. We're actually a new ad tech company. We launched about five months ago, and we focus on leveraging data and technology to deliver on clients' business results. So we primarily focus on addressable execution across all screens. This is an illustration of, is the slide up? It's yeah, up now. Yep. This is an illustration of how we um, do this with the movie studios. So we're focusing on beyond the theatrical window, how can we drive transactions in the rental? Um, period, and we do that by first understanding who is most likely to rent, then the providers that are most likely to drive the most revenue, and then sending the message at the right time to the right consumer, and ultimately getting them to pull out their remote control, rent a movie, um, and then we're able to tie all that back to the actual campaign exposure. I'm uh, Jim Withrich at Warner Brothers, and we have a lot to talk about because uh, at Warner Brothers, I'm responsible for our home entertainment revenue in the Americas and our global strategy. And the way we divide up the responsibilities at Warner Brothers, basically our group is responsible for tran transactional video, so it includes VOD, EST, and then of course the physical formats. Uh, in addition, we have a video game division that um, we oversee. And I'm Jonathan Zepp. I uh, work at Google and YouTube. And really two aspects to my role. One is working really closely with Jim and his team on hoping to sell more movies uh, in the home entertainment window to Google and Android users. Uh, we also do that on the YouTube platform. And then secondarily, I also look after content broadly on YouTube, our sports news and entertainment partnerships uh, for the Americas. And that's across our advertising supported and now subscription business model. So we have a good cross-section here, and we also have already heard of a bunch of different business models here with R-Vot, T-Vot, uh, A-Vot, S-Vot are obviously out there as well. So there are a lot of approaches to get media to consumers nowadays that are beyond the traditional distribution models. What do consumers really want these days? So what is really um, gelling with your audience? What is really like... What do people really respond to uh, out of all these models? And are people really still moving towards transactional? Are they moving away from transactional because subscriptions are getting so big? What are you guys seeing in trends in e each of your respective fields? I don't want to put everybody in a spot, so please, anybody who wants to answer, just. I'd say but. right now, Wonder Woman is what people want. <laughs> so we, we just launched Wonder Woman on EST, electronic sales through uh, last week, and she's doing absolutely wonderful. So I'd say they definitely want that. Uh, there's an undeniable trend right now towards the SVOD platforms that still is growing at a tremendous rate. Um, the transactional models are growing as well, just not as fast. I was just looking at the uh, growth numbers on ownership for the new movies that they come out, and that's running at about 30% this year. So that's a category that's doing quite well. On the other side of it, uh, there's a lot of people who still enjoy getting their content in a physical form. The, the vast majority of consumer spend still in the transactional space is done on disc, it's, uh, it's Blu-ray, it's 4K, uh, it's DVD, so um, there, th we have, th the good news is we have so many different ways for people to interact with the content, which is expanding the overall uh, marketplace, but uh, I'd say the general trends are moving more towards the, um, the digital platforms. Yeah, so I think from my perspective, across all three of the business models that I work on, they're all growing. Um, and I think that what we're seeing is just a general trend towards users wanting flexibility of how, when, and what they watch. And they're willing to make some trade-offs on format of content uh, and maybe even traditionally where they would have expected to, to, uh, to see a supplier of content in exchange for the ability to have what they want, when they want, where they want. Uh, I think all roads from our point of view lead to less friction and convenience being a good thing. Uh, so generally, we try to optimize from a user perspective of getting them to a piece of content, uh, regardless of business model, um, quickly based on what we think their interests are. Uh, you said, uh, no, go ahead. Uh, well, you said, what do they want? They want, um, it seems they want more. And first of all, they want you to respect their intelligence, and they want you to respect their desires, and they want you to respect their time. So we're seeing a lot of interesting trends across the Turner portfolio. Uh, for example, Look, there's a lot going on in the world, so a lot of people would say, I would expect uh, you know, mobile use of, of CNN to be going up, and yeah, it, it adds year over year, second quarter, you'll like this, Kay, second quarter, old CNN person right here, um, uh, up 10% that year, and someone would say, well, that's because right, it's short-form content. That's not necessarily true, because it goes through the rest of the Turner networks, 
cartoon in July was like 21 million video plays, and the majority of that was on mobile. So we're seeing just a tremendous amount of shift to different platforms, which is fine for us. It's not that the same piece of content needs to go across every platform the same way. It's a question of are you giving them exactly that experience when they want it? And since the mobile device is what we don't do without, right? I mean, I've, I spend more time with that than, than anybody in my family, I, I guess, because it's always with me. Um, and so if you look at it like that, you're going to see mobile continue to grow and grow and grow, whether the mobile's this screen or the, or the tablet screen. Um, one in interesting thing that we see is, and it's a good thing, is when we look at the rental business for the studios and then we start to look at EST and the physical copies, um, they're not cannibalizing each other. They're all sort of growing at equal trajectory. So when you look at the rental, VOD, um, person, that's a, a woman, 25 to 54. When you look at an EST, it's 18 to 49. And then the package is, is a different type of person. So I think it's nice that finally in television on the small screen, we have all of this data to know what's working, what's resonating, and then can tie everything back to transaction. Because if we were up here two years ago, we'd have be like, okay, we're spending on TV and, and transactions are up, sales are up. But now if something works, we know exactly what worked and we're able to adapt the advertising for the next campaign to optimize. And I think you know frictionless, as we we already said, is key. And I think I think Avod has an opportunity to be a, a bit of a dark horse here, right? We keep putting the old world of ads into that. It's a two-way communication device. There's way more cool things you can do with it. Actually, Turner has their ad labs, which we're part of, and they've put a whole bunch of different um, ways of pushing content that isn't completely obtrusive to the content that they're they like. It has an impact. It sticks. Um, but there's just not there's not enough of that going on. So I think that could be a dark horse because that's got to be I think the most frictionless way to get content. So if people want more of everything, not just Wonder Woman, but really everything, uh, how do you balance that if you are at a studio or if at the network like BET? How do you balance your assets and how, what do you keep on the network? What do you get out there on, on other platforms and what do you give people just maybe only a digital? Yeah, I think the implications for anybody in the publishing, the content publishing business, whether it's digital or linear or any of those kinds of things, it's, it's like a whole new um, wild, wild west, for lack of a better term. When I joined BET, um, the word that I like to use is ubiquity, that we need to be everywhere that we can be. And actually thinking about the, the, the platforms that uh, our audiences spend a lot of time on, some of them we own and some of them we don't, and figuring out how to actually structure the deal structures, uh, the content arrangements, the deals with talent and digital rights and all of these kinds of things to be able to do it. Um, the reel actually showed the full itera iteration of what, what I aspire for our, our brand to be. Like we need to be on Snapchat, we need to be on Twitter Live, we need to be producing shows for Facebook um, uh, and all of these different things. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it's the same piece of content across all platforms and in fact we found that that doesn't work, right? Um, you have to spend the time to understand exactly how consumers are interacting on that platform and develop specifically for Snapchat, develop specifically and program for Instagram and so on and so forth. So um, I think it means for us is that when you go into these production deals, broad-based production deals, um, that you're asking tougher, more wide-ranging uh, questions and, and having wider-ranging conversations to be able to deliver against this um, implied uh, user expectation that they're going to be able to experience your show or your piece of content in different iterations on multiple platforms. I, is it viable to keep to have all those because you have platforms, then you have plat. Is it viable? To but so um, I don't think we need to be everywhere, um, and and I've whittled it down to six that matter um, beyond linear: uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, Snapchat, Twitter, and Musical.ly, which is growing very fast if, if you have kids in your family. Um, those six alone, um, and having dedicated experts on our teams who understand how to program and how to grow audience and engagement on those platforms, make the benefit, the ROI for us, valuable, particularly if some of those platforms have monetization um, uh, uh, platforms and deal structures that we can uh, avail ourselves at. And that may not be the case for all of them. I'm not going to tell you, do your own research, <laughs> which, which ones are better than others. Um, but there are some out there that actually w work very well with media companies and others that are beginning to have those conversations. <laughs> Come on, how about Turner? How do you decide which crown jewels you're going to give directly to your consumers? Which ones keep in the traditional distribution channels? 
Um, well, if we say direct to consumer, are you talking about what we've done with Boomerang, um, our partnership with Warner Brothers, which is Hanna Barbera and Looney Tunes Library, direct to consumer and Filmstruck direct to consumer? Yeah, f for example, I think. Yeah, that's well, a good um, so those are really interesting ones. So let's uh, let's go to Filmstruck. Turner Classic Movie is really a one revenue stream, right? It's movies from the 20s to the 70s. Um, Network does a very good job of curating a very passionate audience. So we said, how do you take those skill sets and maybe find other film? Fans. So we actually went down, you know, it's the largest library film struck for art house, indies, foreign and cult. So we took that and said, let's take the sensibilities of what we've done well with Turner Classic Movies and go direct. Because that's an unserved. What we knew we wouldn't do is say, hey, we're going to launch a cable network called Filmstruck and go and, and have an arm wrestling match with, with MVPDs to see if you could get carriage. So you have to decide what content works well, I think, direct to consumer. And I think that's a chance for us to launch a new brand and have that work. And Boomerang, you know, there is a linear network, Boomerang. The, there's a certain degree of crossover content, but it's a different experience inside the direct to consumer. So you look at film, it's a, a wonderful broad swath of category to cover just like animation so we looked at those two and said that works incredibly well that yes. go on no go ahead no that doesn't mean that cnn for example is not on you know every digital platform you can imagine you know it's on it's on snapchat the google watch it's unedited feed on facebook it's everywhere it's got a mobile app it's dot com so you you just have to figure out what content and i don't think that means we decide necessarily what content you want on what platform you should get to choose that I'm glad somebody's on the Google search because. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Jason, what do you see in terms of companies coming to you and trying to spin up maybe, are there a lot of pop-up channels or a lot of experiments these days where people are just trying these direct-to-consumer avenues for a little while or are people fully committed to it? Yeah, I, I mean, to me, it's all about experimentation, right? And I think um, getting, and one of the tech, the tough things is it's, there's a tech stack there, right? So it's not, these are generally speaking not tech, you know, these aren't Netflix with 2,500 engineers, right? And a lot of you have multiple apps, right? Um, so they have a very complex problem, but it is about um, experimentation. Um, they are spinning up brands and putting them down. There's, uh, you know, we're based in Canada. There's been a couple that have spun up and tried different business models. They didn't work. They put them down and try others. Um, but I think looking at the mixture of TVOD and AVOD and, and SVOD is big. And each audience is different and each platform is different. So you've really got to think through your process. I mean, Filmstruck knew exactly who their audience was, what platforms, what they wanted from an experience. Um, and then, you know, you've got to play with all kinds of variables like pricing and stats and data and what's available. So uh, it is about experimentation. There's no one fits all for sure. So I think that's... Um, something that, you, you know, if you don't take a risk, I think we heard that a lot today, that the ones that take risks will win. If you just do what you did before, it's a formula for not success. I have a question for you guys. Um, so is it hard to monetize all the different screens because there's no unified measurement across them? It's like the biggest barrier to get an advertiser to go in, right? Like you don't have like a Nielsen rating across all the different screens. So how are you monetizing the different uh, distribution? Um, it, it's a challenge, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure that it is my challenge. Um, um, the, the good news about all of the platforms that I just mentioned, they're big enough and at scale, and they're doing direct business with many of the advertisers and the brands out in the marketplace. And so if you're Coca-Cola, you already know what the value proposition is for being on Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook and all of those kinds of things. What makes it a little bit harder for us as a television network um, is that our our key, uh, the majority of our revenue is going to be generated from our linear right. relationship uh, with, with that with that brand. Now, does that brand want to follow that content where it can go across other platforms, especially ones that you don't own? Absolutely. And like I said before, some of these platforms have um, structures. I'll, I'll use Twitter as an example because it's public. I mean, everyone's heard of Twitter Amplify. Um, Twitter Amplify is a really easy way for a media company like us to attach and scale incremental reach to um, content that's on our, that, that's been generated and created for our platforms. Um, and I think that that's the struggle for us. Like, it's harder to do that across Facebook. It's, uh, YouTube is an, is an easier place. Snapchat is sort of like in the middle. Um, uh, and what we really want to solve for when I'm sitting in front of an advertiser is trying to make that as seamless as possible. We, I know that my users are going from television to mobile devices to third-party platforms, and they're expecting different experiences across all of those things now. And, and for me to actually try to deliver against that and then bring the money conversation along works better on some platforms than, uh, than others. 
think one of the other challenges that people have is that we have set expectations about how people consume media on different screens and maybe they're not always accurate or maybe they're actually evolving over time and that's a question for you probably jonathan because google has talked or youtube has talked in particular about really long mobile viewing sessions what's the average viewing session on youtube these days it's 45 minutes or an hour or something like that something really long so what what do you see in the way people shift consumption habits on these newer devices and how what does it mean for content producers yeah uh viewing sessions are quite long about 60 percent of our overall watch time on the platform now comes from uh, mobile consumption so and we've seen that number continue to increase year after year and no signs of it slowing down so the convenience for sure that mobile enables uh will continue to draw viewership. I think we've also seen pretty significant growth in the living room recently as well. So, you know, I would be hesitant to say that the only path for viewership in a digital environment is around mobile. I think that'll be a key piece, but I think the optionality from a consumer perspective, just knowing there really aren't constraints of when and how you should view programming is really the more important factor. Uh, and really the lines are blurring, to be honest. Um, from a mobile perspective, we see a lot of both consumption and in the home entertainment business transactions that might happen on mobile, but might be delegated for a cast experience uh, in a living room environment. I think when we think about more premium content uh, in you know, 4K resolution and things like that, there are use cases that do make sense for a living room and we'll wanna continue to make those easy options too. We're also seeing people do a lot of the discovery on the mobile and then go, okay, now I know what I want to have and then go load up Netflix or whatever service it is and watch it there, right? So it's interesting. They're, they're mixing the modes already a little bit too. Um, as you explore working with these different mo screens and maybe also bringing the screens together, casting was interesting. Um, what kind of lessons have you learned? And again, everybody can chime up on uh, what kind of things have you tried to address people on multiple screens and maybe address the same audience on multiple screens at the same time? Uh, a couple of years ago, people everybody tried social TV. These days, maybe it is really getting those, connecting those screens. But what have you tried and what lessons have you learned in that process? So um, I could talk a little bit about an experience that, that we've had. Um, one of the feature sets that consumers really loved about the DVD was this concept of uh, additional content, enhanced content is what we call it. So it's uh, deleted scenes, bloopers, information about the, the actors and, and the creators of the product and such. And then we moved to the digital world and people are increasingly buying that product there, but we've never had a uh, a good um, experience in the digital space that really took advantage of what digital brings to the table. Um, on the physical side, once you stamp that disc, you're pretty much done. That's what's going to go on that disc and go in the marketplace. In the digital world, that's not the case anymore. This is live product and it continues to be updated. So we wanted to create a product that would um, take advantage of the, the platforms that we were going on. We, we termed this, um, this product next generation because it was basically moving forward in, in the concept of, of ownership product and moving off of, of disk. And so we created this great experience. We did a lot of consumer focus groups, talked to tons of consumers, told us what they wanted. We built this product. We put it up on the living room screen. And then people got to it and we put it in front of them. They said, this is too much work. We, this does not work for us to get to the content that we actually want. And we, what we discovered in that process was um, consumers, A, will tell you what they want, and then you give them what they want, and it turns out in, in the actual experience it doesn't work out so well. But the other thing is when you're on the big screen, the 10-foot experience, it's much different than when it's sitting in your lap and you've got it in, in, in your lap. So we went back to the drawing board, did a bunch of changes, and then we optimized this next-gen product actually for mobile, so for your tablets and for your phone. And basically what it allows you to do is to enjoy the content, the movie, in a landscape form, and you can watch the, the show. If you want to go deeper into the content, you just flip it up in portrait mode, and then you start getting all this live content. And it might be um, shopping related to the scene that you're actually watching. It might be a, a bio. It might be showing where a particular uh, scene was actually shot. So the product updates on a regular basis, but it gives the control to the consumer. And what we learned through that experience, uh, consumers interact with the content, even though it may be the same content, the base content, differently depending on what the device is. I, I do think additional content, this, this, this fan content is a great differentiator. If you look at Netflix as one of the major competitors for a lot of the major media companies, they don't have that. They really wouldn't be able to weave that in. And there is a a new standard CPE manifest, and, and I think um, Filmstruck has a lot of additional content, and I've, 
Uh, I think that is a great way to differentiate and, and actually maybe even weaving in the way you deliver that content with ad content. So you get value in where you, where you get it. But I, I don't know. It if does. No, you, you're right. We got the backstories. We got interviews. We got the other pieces. And that's the curation piece of it that I think it, 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 something like Filmstruck brings, just like Turner Classic Movies did, that makes it so rich. If you want to immerse yourself inside of that, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper, which is part of our differentiating factor. I think the other part that's different about this is that the fans want to engage with the content. And if you give them a platform and, and, and a way to do it in, in, a, in a legitimate way and make it easy for them, they will engage with it yes. and they will spread it around. So one of the features that we built into this next gen product is the ability to share clips, to comment on the clips and put it out into their social media space. So they, they become your, your advocates then. Jason. I think we talked before this panel a little bit and you, you told me that um, you also had discussions with clients that wanted to do too much with some of their products. Yeah, I mean, if I were to give one big lesson learned, it would be, you know, you, you need to take your, your um, fans, your audience along with you, right? We've seen cases where they've done too little. They rebooted, built a new foundation, didn't have the features they had before, but they had to wipe it out. But we've certainly seen the other extreme where large organization took a while to get it going by the time they got it out it was a 2.0 release and they had left their fans behind and they and they didn't like the extreme change i mean as humans we like baby steps so innovate with your audience would be a big one we, we've seen and i won't go into specific examples but i mean you, you need to do these steps with them right take uh take stages innovate iterate um and and again that goes back to tech pick the right tech partners for that stuff too right because it's not a once off and then leave it for 18 24 months this is something you should probably bring in house own it and uh, and i think we heard a lot of that today too the era of just hey i'm going to outsource this to x company and just do it all you've got to bring this stuff in house i think do you have any similar uh, lessons or hard moments at BET? Um, I'll, I'll share lots of failure, if you like. <laughs> but you learn from failure. That's what they say. <laughs> you learn the most. That's where you learn the most. Um, uh, let's just talk about Snapchat. Uh, if you'd have said to me, even three years ago, that I would be learning how to tell stories, narrative stories, in 10-second bits, uh, that, that I would have you know, laughed you out of the room. Um, and this is a competency. This is a, a muscle that we have actually had to, to uh, exercise and, and grow internally at, at being able to tell stories on a platform that has literally 10 second bits if, if, if you spend any time on it. And, and it is actually a compelling experience. If you follow Comedy Central or, or MTV, some of our sister networks, we're, we're doing a Snapchat show uh, right now, for uh, that's going to be adjacent to a linear show that we're going to launch um, in October, um, and the experience is a brand new viewing experience on the Snapchat platform, germane to Snapchat, but actually linked to the linear version. So it's going to be very interesting. Um, my colleague Chris McCarthy, who runs MTV, uh, is reimagining TRL uh, along along. If for those of you who are old enough to remember what it, what it was, like me, <laughs> um, like uh, reimagining it uh, on the understanding that you could come to the marketplace with something that is old but make it new again by being on these platforms in a unique ways. So, so I, I think we have we have tried and failed, like you uh, mentioned, and learned a lot about how to tell stories in in these new mediums. And it is and it's hard. It's not easy. It takes dedicated resources. You need to build in the infrastructure. And it's not just a teenager who just graduated college uh, um, on, on a team here. You're talking, I, we have, like, it, to program a Snapchat Discover platform, uh, we have nine people, and some of them are animators, producers, writers, and gifts, and they do this on a daily basis. I call it like producing a book on a daily basis, of you know, having to, to take uh, editorial content, shoot it differently, uh, produce it differently, write around it differently, on the understanding that people are going to be flipping right, flipping left, looking at it for 10 short short seconds, but when you do it well, it is actually a very compelling way to extend uh, a brand into onto these platforms. Okay, I'm not gonna let you go out there on failures all by yourself. <laughs> now, this isn't really a failure, but it's absolutely a misstep. <laughs> so when you launch a direct-to-consumer product, do not pick a set date, okay? Don't do that. <laughs> because when Jason talks about the tech stack, that is a very mysterious place, and things break, <laughs> okay? So we actually picked a date to launch Filmstruck. And we were all excited. We got our launch party going. This is great. And then about six days out, we find out there's just a couple of problems in tech stack. I'm sure you've never seen that happen before, have you? So we literally had to go out to our, our fan base and say, 
I know we said it was ready. We need a little bit longer. And we picked a month. So once again, we're playing with the clock, which is always dangerous, but you have to get, say a time, right? So we said it'll be coming next month. We actually delivered um, two days into the month. So we were early based on our late delivery. How's that sound? Like we're patting ourselves on the back. But literally, when you're, when you're going to do something like that, the element of time is very important, and the tech stack is a very uh, dangerous place, and you got to get that right before you're out there. So that was a lesson learned. Yeah. And by the way, they were very uh, forgiving. The fans were very forgiving because we told them what was wrong. Um, so, so what is the next big thing that you guys are looking towards? Uh, whether it's to promote your existing assets or whether it's maybe expanding into new services, is it is it VR at this point? Is it AR apps to have to promote maybe existing franchises and assets? What is the next big thing on the horizon or the next exciting thing on the horizon? Um, I think for us, it's actually getting to a point that we have true cross-screen um, execution. So you're able to, before a campaign, understand the reach frequency across screens and then on the back end um, get the results. So the way that we buy television is different than television has been bought for the last 50 years. Like I'm not buying a GRP, I'm buying an impression against an audience. Like I'm not giving an advertiser a schedule. Um, so being able to connect all the different data spines and um, get the reach frequency, it's all possible. It's just manual now. So I think when people think of addressable television and programmatic television, everyone thinks there's all these sexy dashboards. It's manual right now. You can connect it. So I think that once we start to take some of the technology and automate it pieces of television, um, all the data that's being fed into it is really an exciting time to be in the TV ecosystem. Um, VI, VR, AI, um, and I, I'll tell you right now, I, I don't know how it works, but <laughs> I mean, in a sense of how, how can I scale audiences around it and then and bring money into it, but maybe that's not the point right now. Uh, maybe I should just take a, a, a linear show and see if we can actually shoot it in VR and see how many people engage with it. We've done some tests around some of our big award shows um, that, that show some promise, uh, but, I, but I think we have, um, when I worked at CNN um, with, with Coleman back in the days, um, it, it, you wouldn't have experimented the way that we are now required to in order to stay abreast of this stuff. Like this, it, this, you just have to figure out how you carve out the resources and the people to be able to build and play on these platforms before they get to scale. Because if you want to jump on what it is at scale, you're already one step behind. You know, I think it's got to be a big event. You know, CNN just did Eclipse of the Century. I don't know if, if anybody participated. I was actually on the road driving. but. Um, on the day of the eclipse, you could uh, download the app and you could follow for two hours. CNN would, there were seven different points where it was a total eclipse. So you could have a VR experience. And I think it was like 5.7 million video starts, which makes it a pretty big virtual reality event. So, so you know, you don't think about how do you monetize that at the time. You're just going, this is a really big event and what do you do around it? And we're doing this with E-League now. So if anybody's a gamer in the room, you know, it starts tomorrow. Um, uh, where basically there's, uh, for the, for the multi-game player, it's our partnership with, with IMG. So the 16 teams are gonna compete, and now they're gonna be sensors and microprocessors to actually, for the players, the five individuals who play against the other five, to look at eye movement and vital signs to track their decision-making, their reflexes. So you're actually now pulling like the fans into the mind of the players, which is just utterly fascinating, so. I think it's games, I think it's big events, yeah. um, and sports, where I think this plays out really well. Jim is having a video game uh, studio under you. Does it help to get some of those ideas in and maybe also use them in other areas? Yeah, so there, you know, there's, it's a great time to be in the content business because so many things are changing, not only the platforms that we can put the content on, but how you create the content and such. So in the video game space, obviously the, the real hot, hot area is in, in mobile and how do you make games as a service and it's taking up more and more people's time. So if you're talking about what people do on their mobile device, is there's a gold rush just around that space and trying to make it happen. Esports is a, is a big area. So how do you make these games that, that everybody's playing on a regular basis into a, a, a wider spectator sport? And that business is, is taking off and it's tremendously exciting. On the uh, VR side, VR, AR, um, what, what our fans want to do is they want to go deeper into these worlds and the technology is allowing them to be part of those worlds. You just heard on the, the panel that was just before us talking about VR and AR and those experiences. And if you had a chance 
to, to do some of these experiences, the void and some of these other things, it's absolutely incredible. So what we're concentrating at Warner Brothers is trying to play in all these spaces. To your point, you have to be in all these spaces. You can't just wait until a market develops. So 4K is another one of those markets that is tremendously exciting to us because it's 4K with high dynamic range. And for the first time, consumers can have actually a better picture in their home than what you would do when you go into a theater just based on the, the color depth and breadth that you can get. So the technology is providing things that we were never able to do uh, in the content space. So a lot going on. Yeah, I think these guys are right. The combination of machine learning and VR, AR is gonna revolutionize every aspect of entertainment. I think we will probably all have a different point of view on what that timeline is. So I think that in the near term, there's actually some really interesting problems that need to be solved around fragmentation. So today, as a user, uh, I spend a lot of time on Google Play, I spend a lot of time on YouTube, I spend a lot of time on Hulu and Netflix and several other apps that it's kind of a pain to like jump back and forth. So I think platforms like Google have a role in helping make that process a little more efficient as the world of content investment continues to be fragmented around uh, some really um, you know, cool content in different places. All right, so I got this sign, we're almost out of time. Let's do one last quick lightning round where everybody can tell me a little bit about what's next for you or your company rather. Um, what's next for Filmstruck, for example, uh, or, or one of your other kind of franchises? Wow, what's next? Um, I think we'll look at making the Filmstruck um, to the point of how do you make it different. I think we'll go deeper in curation, deeper in the overall consumer experience to make it better. It's only been around 10 months, so we'll continue to just expand that experience and listen very closely because we got great feedback because we actually get data now. You know, going with traditional means, you don't always know what your customers are saying and thinking, but now we actually do, so we'll continue to uh, just enhance that overall experience. And the same thing with Boomerang. Boomerang, you'll see more games come into play as well. Uh, I would say uh, new ways to monetize content, um, just adding a lot of creativity to that. And I know our clients would like to see universal search uh, solved in some way of making it easier to f discovery, I would even say. Um, I'll get old fashioned on you and uh, I'm uniquely interested in taking uh, digital and social experiences and taking them offline and actually bringing them to life at events. We, did, we do a big event called the BTX, uh, BT Experience here at LA Live. 165,000 people, um, and that's just the beginning. I'd, I'd love to see that scale around the country and actually take the interactions and the touches with our brands and bring them to life with people. Um, we'll continue to build out our platform to leverage data um, to change the way that we market and really market um, based on performance and instead of just running a campaign for reach, we'll know if a campaign worked or if it didn't work and then be able to optimize for the future. I think the big thing from Warner Brothers and many of the various divisions, including the one that I oversee, is how do you create an experience that the consumer can go deeper into? So how can I go into this world of DC or into a world of, of Wonder Woman and, and make it uh, more experiential, go beyond just what's on the, on the screen today and connect with other people? And that's what content really allows. So you'll see a lot more coming from Warner Brothers in that space. I'll end where I started, reduce friction in all aspects of consumption. Okay, that Thank sounds you very easy. Much. <laughs>